Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Grace Church on Wednesday night, and uh, thankful all you guys came out. Grateful for the ones on YouTube right now and internet. Radio right now is going out there. People all over the place. And we have the privilege of looking at the Word of God together. We have the privilege of reading the Word of God together. I have the privilege to proclaim the Word of God to you. You have the privilege to receive the Word of God proclaimed. And we make sure that all the honor and glory goes to Jesus. Because Jesus wants you to know where you've been, where you are, and where you're going. He loves you that much. He gave you a personal copy of the word. Matter of fact, Jesus wants you to know where the world has been and where the world is and where the world's going. He doesn't want you in the dark. And he gives us the Holy Spirit so that when we read this book, we can hear God not just with our ears, we can hear God with our heart. True story, we had a huge funeral here yesterday. Unbelievable, like 1,200 guys showed up. It was unbelievable. And yet the mother, the mother of the, the biker guy that had died, I got talking with her and she came back into my office. Her name's Patsy. And she just wanted to say thank you to our church that we would host this funeral for her son. And I told Patsy, I said, I just met her. I met her for the first time. And I told Patsy, I said, that's not a problem. That's why we're here. That's why God put our church together 38 years ago for your son and all his friends to come together. We, we want to do this. I said, it's weird. Now I'm talking to the mom. I said, but I've been looking forward to this. I said, have you ever been in this building before? She said, no. I said, can I show you where we're going to have your son's funeral? So I took her from my office around the front desk and walked in and got right here. And she said this word. She said, it's beautiful. It used to be a grocery store. She said, this is beautiful. Now you have to put it in context. I just met this mom, Patsy, whose son just died last week. And I'm telling you, 11, 1,200 bikers are about to show up for the funeral. And she said, beautiful. I said, well, let me take you down. And so we came down here. We got talking and talking about the family a little bit and kind of how the flow is going to go for the service. We got back to the back again. And she said, you know, the Bible never used to talk to me. She said, I, I would try to read the Bible. and she, I, It never talked to me, she said, until I got saved. Now, I didn't knock on the door. She knocked on the door, okay? And I said, so how did you get saved? And she said, well, I was really interested in the book of Revelation. And I was trying to understand the book of Revelation. And she said, and then I realized I need Jesus. And I received Jesus. I got saved. And all of a sudden, I could comprehend. I could hear the book of Revelation. I said, it's like your Bible started talking to you, right? She said, yes. Like it was singing to you. And she said, yes. And I said, so where'd you end up going to church? And she told me the church. Are you still going there? She said, no, something just wasn't right there. And I said, I understand. So what do you do now? She said, well, I watched David Jeremiah. Oh, oh. Now you're talking my language. I didn't do that, but inside I'm going, oh. I said, I, said, I got to drop something on you right now. I mean, I've only known this lady five minutes. I said, I got to drop something on you. I said, because you know, some churches, and they, they bring the word this way, and they just focus on these parts. I said, but then there's, not, there's other guys like David Jeremiah. He brings you the word. He brings you the word. If you're hooked on Jeremiah, I said, you need to know, he's on our radio station. And I told her, I said, now I use different spices than David Jeremiah uses because I spice it the way I want. But we're doing the same thing. We're just bringing the word to God's people. I made a new friend yesterday. I made a lot of new friends yesterday. 
And a couple of old bikers that showed up. I said, where have you been? Where have you been? You're one of my guys right here. And the guy started crying. I miss you. I, well, I miss you. I'm here twice a week. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on. I'm here. I think sometimes we take for granted what we have. That on a Wednesday night, we get to open up the Word of God together, not to get information up here, but transformation here, and, and to kind of get our equilibrium. You know, the world's going nuts, everybody's going crazy, but we shouldn't be. We shouldn't be in a panic. We shouldn't be upset. We shouldn't be wondering if God probably doesn't know what He's doing, or maybe He doesn't know. God knows everything He's doing, He's told us in advance. So just settle down. Let's find out what Jesus told us. We've been looking the last three weeks. Tonight would be the third. I keep thinking, well, this might be the last. I don't know. It depends what happens this next week. Depends what happens. I don't, well, what's going to happen? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But I do know what Jesus told us. So if we're looking at Israel, we've been talking about why Israel and tonight I want to look at Israel like, what's next? What's next? And the Bible gives us several scenarios of what, what's next. I just don't know how they fall. But what I know for sure, look, take your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew 23. And verse 37. Matthew 23, verse 37. That's on page uh, 1214. That's on page 1214. So here's Jesus, after his three years of ministry, he's really close to the cross at this point in time. And he has this lament over Jerusalem. All that he's done, all that he's accomplished. And he says in verse 37 of chapter 23, matter of fact, I'm going to have you stand. You guys stand for the reading of the word here. We're going to read four chapters. You're just going to stand the whole time. Okay, we're going to read like four verses and here we go. So here's what Jesus says to Jerusalem. Here's what he says. He says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. The one, the city who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often, Jerusalem, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you were not willing. See, your, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, Jerusalem, I say to you, you shall see me no more until you say, Jerusalem, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I came unto the Jews, and the Jews received me not. I came as a Jew, and you rejected me. The same as the prophets of the Old Testament, and you can read the Old Testament, and, and God in his grace would tell them the future, God in his grace would tell them the message, God in his grace, but they did not receive it. They didn't hold on to it. They didn't believe it. They didn't live it. And time after time, they would just kill the prophet, kill the prophet, kill him. And God being faithful to his covenant sent his son, his only begotten son, the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one, the one that they had been waiting for, oh, with a different definition though. And he told them the truth. And he healed them and walked on water and fed them and wowed them with this sermon. Nobody could preach like Jesus. Nobody can preach like Jesus. And the bottom line, they still said no. Israel officially said no. Jerusalem officially said no. And here's Jesus saying, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. I wanted to be like this hen, this mother hen that would just gather her chicks. But now you've rejected me. 
So I need to tell you, you won't see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of. You won't see me again until you receive me. You won't see me again until you love me. Do you understand how profound of a statement that is? That means he's coming back. You won't see me again until you say. That means they're going to say it somewhere down the road. That's been 2,000 years. But God didn't say, I'm done with you, forget you, go to hell. God didn't say, hey, I'm going to come up with the Gentiles in the church and replace Israel. No, 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 no. We don't believe in replacement theology. We did not replace her. She's coming back. Oh, she hasn't said yet, blessed is he who comes in the name. She hasn't received him yet. She's not believing Israel yet. She hasn't done it yet. But she's in the land. She's in the city. The holy mount is right there. And we're a whole lot closer than we were 100 years ago. We're a whole lot closer when... Uh, Scott Davey was born. Where's Scott? I got to pick up Scott. When Scott Davey was born. We're, we're a whole lot closer than when I was in junior high. We're a whole lot closer because we're in Jerusalem and they have access to the Holy Mount. We're a whole lot closer than ever before. Now, we already know, we already know she is not. Now, individual Israelis are receiving the Lord. That's, that's unbelievable. That's so, so good. But Israel as a nation, uh-uh. Nope. Nope. And yet God's preparing her. Things are going to rise up around her. There will be a treaty signed. And then tribulation like you can't believe is coming. And finally at the end of that... She'll know she needs Jesus. Doesn't Jesus do the same thing for you? He doesn't come and find you when you're all peace and safety and, you know, I'm just enjoying the blessing of the Lord. I've always been blessing the Lord. Usually tribulation has to come your way. Usually you have to get desperate. Usually there's no way out except Jesus. No way out except Jesus. And then all of a sudden, blessed is he, the Lord Jesus who comes in the name of the Lord to me. That's what happened to Patsy. That's what's happened to most of us. And that's what will happen to Israel. I pray it happens to all of us tonight. Not just salvation, but blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus, come and teach us. Show us what's going on. Show us that, you know, what, what are we up against? And basically, he said, you're not up against anything. Just trust me. I got the whole thing figured out. Really? I thought you needed us. I don't need you. I just want you. Just want you. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your grace upon grace upon grace. Going all the way back to the garden, you should have just messed us all up and thrown us away but you chose a plan to where your son would die in place of Adam and Eve and everybody else and all we have to do is receive it I pray everybody here tonight Lord has received the free gift of salvation somehow we're not robots it's not an automatic even though you orchestrate all things we still have decisions that we get to make yes or no for Jesus I pray that all of us say yes we trust you, Lord. Pray for Israel tonight and your protection over her. We know you're sovereign. We know you're moving her in the direction by your sovereign will to where finally one day she will say yes to Jesus and all the other countries around her, Lord. We don't know what's the time frame right now. We don't know. We confess that. But we know something's going on. Help us, Lord, I pray, to hear your voice and that we just might be steady through this season of history pointing people to Jesus. I do pray for Patsy tonight and Jesse, Lord, and Stephen and all the friends that were in this building and out in the parking lot yesterday. I pray, I pray they could hear the voice of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord. Accomplish your work.
for your glory. It's in the name of Jesus. God's people would say, hey, greet somebody around you. Welcome them to uh, Wednesday night church tonight. Okay, keep your Bibles open. We are in Matthew 24. Keep your Bibles open. Matthew 23 introduces us to Matthew 24. Israel will say yes, but what do we do in the meantime? What happens next, you might say, for Israel? What happens next, biblically? Matthew 24 and verse 1. Then Jesus went out, departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. Jesus said to them, do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. You know, they're all enamored by the buildings and specifically the temple and the Holy Mount was unbelievable. It was unbelievable. And they're all wowed by that. And Jesus said, let me tell you what's going to happen next. It's all coming down. Ain't going to make it. Jerusalem, no more. Stone by stone. Not, not one stone left upon another. And sure enough, 30 some years after he said that, here comes Rome, here comes Nero, Titus specifically, and wiped out Jerusalem completely. Took her out. Every stone overturned. Every stone of the temple overturned. Looking for the gold underneath. What I'm just sharing with you is what Jesus said prophetically happened in our history. It came true. What your Bible says, what Jesus says always comes true in his time frame. Not yours. And you say, well, why did, why did God do that? To disperse the Jews around the world for 2,000 years. 2,000 years. Well, why did he do that? Because they rejected his son. You're not, you're not good. I'm not coming back to you, Israel, until you say, blessed is who comes in the name. So pfft, there goes Jerusalem. There goes Israel. Here comes Rome. And they're, they're gone for 2,000 years. That, that's why that they're back is miraculous. You can't have him coming to rescue Israel if you don't have a rescue or if you don't have an Israel. So I keep saying it over and over again. Every time you see Israel, you have to say, my Bible is true. That's a miracle. May 14th, 1948 should have never happened, but it did in a day. Hitler tried to wipe him out. Six million, he killed him. And the rest of the population of Jews said, we got to go home. We got to go home. And they came out of the prison camps, the death camps. They, they, they got back there. Nobody gave them a chance. Nobody gave them a shot. They, they'll never make it. And sure enough, they made it. Do you know why? Because God is sovereign. He has a plan for Israel. He does. And whoever comes against them, well, it might look like it's winning right now, but it ain't going to win. Because he's going to come and save them with us coming with him. Now, I got to move on. I got to move on because that's not really the sermon. But anyways, you got it. You got it. That came true. So what? Now, as he sat at the Mount of Olives, at the, Mount of Olives the disciples came to him privately and said, tell us, could you tell us when these things will be? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ. Will deceive many, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not troubled. Don't be troubled by wars and rumors of wars. That's what Jesus said. Don't be troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and pestilences, earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. 
I mean, you're always going to have antichrist. You're always going to have wars. You're always going to have famines. You're always, you're you're just going to have this. You need to know. But as that is increased, as you go through time, it's the beginning of sorrows. Not the end of the sorrows, it's the beginning of sorrows. What's interesting, the wording used right there, it's the beginning of labor pains, birth pains. You got to know when all this stuff is happening, the baby's coming. You got to know as you line them up. One thing I know about birth pains, been through it three times with my wife. Don't ever want to go through it again. <laughs> right now, you wives are thinking, well, you didn't go through the birth pains. I know. My wife's right back there, and I watched her go through the birth pains. <laughs> Whose fault is that? Eve's? Adam's? But one thing that happened, even when I thought my wife was dying, all three times I thought she was dying. I thought, this is it. She's dying this time. It's horrendous. But you know what happened? Out comes Billy. Out comes Andrew. Out comes Katrina. And then you know what Cindy did? She was all excited. The baby's here. Translated, you have to always keep. Because this is not if it happens. No, it's already happening. One thing I can be dogmatic about, hey, what happens next? Well, it's been going on. But what's next is birth pains. It's birth pains. What's that going on with Israel? A whole lot of stuff. Well, what does that mean? One thing I can be dogmatic, it's birth pains. It's, it's the most severe birth pain she's had since she got reunited there in the land. It's a serious contraction. Well, when's the baby coming? I don't know. We went through all that false labor and you thought and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I don't know. But it's a birth pain. Don't you miss it. Don't take it for granted. Jesus is coming back. And all the stuff you see happening in the world is proof of it. Did I quote him accurately? That's what he said. Uh, Okay, now this is a freebie. I'm just throwing this out there. Here's just a freebie. This is kind of like an extra little nugget, just in case you're into that kind of stuff. Because I don't want to get into like, well, what's good? No, no, no. I just want to know what we know, what we know. In Luke chapter 17, Jesus said it this way. Can I see Luke chapter 17? Birth pains, there should be Luke 17. I'm still looking. There we go. Thank you. Luke 17, 20, Jesus said, as, and as it was in the days of Noah. Can I hear you say days of Noah? Yeah. As it was in days of Noah, so it shall be also, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. In other words, kind of be tracking Noah, what happened with Noah, and everybody sinned so bad. There's so much in the, in the world, God just said, I have to wipe it out. I have to wipe. So it's going to be, you know, Mary giving them marriage and all that. But what's interesting, now this is just a nugget. Don't, don't make this your memory verse. It's not the sermon. But as it was in the days of Noah. So if you go back to the days of Noah, in your Bible, Genesis chapter 6. Can I see the verse? I think it's verse 11. Genesis six eleven. The earth was, the earth also was corrupt before God. Yes. And the earth was filled with violence as it was in the days of Noah well what was it in the days of Noah the earth was corrupt it was filled with violence you know what the word violence is in the Hebrew Hamas first time in the Old Testament in the Hebrew Check it out later. Don't go to Blue Letter now. Just trust me. I've looked. It says Hamas. Ha! That's interesting. How many times does Hamas show up in the Old Testament? 60 times. Well, is that where Hamas got their name? I don't know. I just know Hamas is in the Bible, and God said we got to wipe them out. That was a freebie. (laughs) Just a brief. <laughs> what do we know for sure? Ah, birth pains, birth pains. But what could it be? Now, when I say that, I want to be accurate. I did not say, what will it be? I said, what could it be? And this is where you have to get very careful because there's, there's so many prophetic guys out there and putting things together. Well, there's Hamas and that's what it means. No, that's interesting. 
That's interesting. But when I say it could be, I'm not saying that it will be. Am, am I, are you following me? So God doesn't tell us everything exactly the way you would want following a recipe to bake a cake. He tells you what you need to know. What do we need to know? You need Jesus and know there's birth pains and he's coming back. Well, what could be happening? Well, could be Damascus. Could. You say, what do you mean about Damascus? Well, could. If you've been with me to Israel, when we go up on the Golan Heights, up on the Golan Heights, you can see the road to Damascus. That's the road that the Saul of Tarshish got saved. If you know anything about your Bible, over and over again, it says that Damascus will be destroyed. And it has been many times. But you also know today, Damascus is the capital of Syria. Two million people live in Damascus. And they're, they're right next, I mean, right next to Israel. It ain't like they're a long ways away. They're, they're neighbors. And you need to know, you know, Russia's there and we're there and there's been contradictions. If you followed Damascus, I've been always following Damascus. Why? Well, because it's a little sea, could be Something's going to go on. You say, where'd you get that? Well, it's all through the Old Testament, specifically Isaiah 17. Isaiah 17. And you're saying, well, what are you saying? I'm just saying it's a could. I'm not saying it is, but it could be something. Isaiah chapter 17, verse 1, that's on page 850. Well, Pastor Bill, just tell us the truth. I am telling the truth. I'm just telling you the truth. Some things we don't know for sure. Damascus is one of the things we don't know. For. I, I know for sure she's coming down. I know that. You say, how do you know that? Well, I read this verse before you turned there. Isaiah 17 verse 1 says, The burden against Damascus. Behold, Damascus will cease from being a city. It will become a ruinous heap. Wow. That seems pretty specific. If you go back and look at Isaiah 7, it started in Isaiah 7. If you study all of your Bible, you'll realize, or history, it's got wiped out numerous times, but it's always come back. So what do you mean? So all I'm saying when I'm watching stuff and I'm paying attention to stuff, I, I don't look up Damascus, but when I hear Damascus, the little thing goes up. Ooh, that's interesting. They, they shoot off rockets there. We shoot off rockets the other way there. I say we, meaning Israel, and we sometimes, United States. Flying all around, and it only takes one place, something going wrong, and Damascus could be that place. Could be. What do we pay attention to? Birth pains. Israel. Jesus coming. Well, now you got us all whacked out about Damascus. Don't be. It's a little could be. Got questions, actually has this on Damascus. History shows Damascus has been destroyed many times, but its final destruction may very well occur at the beginning of Jesus' 1,000 year rule, the millennial kingdom, over the earth from his throne in Jerusalem. That's an interpretation. As foretold in Psalms 2 9, our Lord will destroy his enemies. You will break them with a rod of iron, you will dash them to pieces like pottery. At this future judgment, Damascus will be no more. You should pray for Damascus. You should pray for the church in Damascus. You should pray that Damascus, who's in the very sovereign hand of God, will only do what God allows Damascus to do. And then everybody else that wants to do stuff to Damascus. You should be very, very thankful you don't live in Damascus. Good. Well, what's going to happen next? Birth pains, for sure. Damascus, hmm, maybe, maybe not. Well, what else could happen? Oh. Okay, this is a bigger could. Bigger could, not as little. Bigger could. Because it hasn't happened yet. It hasn't happened yet. And to be very honest, before I tell you, don't show them yet, Damascus. Don't show them yet. Don't show them yet. Before I show you the third one, birth pains, Damascus, this one will happen. We just don't know when. We know where. We know who. 
We know what. We even know the purpose of it. We know the purpose of it. But we don't know where to put it. Is that like before the tribulation, before the rapture, right before the tribulation starts? Is it after Israel gets this peace treaty with the Antichrist? Does it happen in the middle? I'm just telling you, we don't know where to put it. And you can read all different things and all different stuff. And so they put it where they want to put it. But I'm just being honest, we don't know where to put it. But it's going to happen. It's going to happen. And so I pay a little bit more attention to this one. Matter of fact, it gets me kind of fired up. And it's really, the other thing, it's really complicated. It's really complicated. It's Gog and Magog. Gog and Magog. You say, where's that? Ezekiel chapter 38. Damascus is a little kid. Gog and Magog is a kug. <laughs> is a more, but it's still a question mark. I don't know where, I don't know where. And I want to be very careful. But I watch. I watch Israel. And then I watch all of her enemies that want to take her out. And then sometimes just for entertainment, I'll read Ezekiel 38 and 39 and say, well, explain that to us. I'm going to explain it to you a little bit, but we're going to read it. Make sure you're watching your Bible. I'm just going to read it. I, it doesn't need a lot of explaining. I've already told you, I don't know when it's going to, it's going to happen. I just don't know when. Chapter 38 of Ezekiel, you guys there, page 1063. Please follow in your Bible so you know I'm not messing with you. Ezekiel 38, verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog, the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, Tubal, and the prophecy against him, and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I'm against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. I will turn you around, put hooks into your jaws, lead you out with your army, your horses, your horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia. That's Iran, by the way. Persia, Ethiopia, Libya are with them. All of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all its troops, the house of Togar, Togarmuth, from the far north and all its troops. Many people are with you. Prepare yourself, be ready. You and your companies that are gathered about you and be a guard for them. After many days, you will be visited in the latter years. In the latter years, you will come into the land of those brought back from the sword and gathered from many people on the mountains of Israel, which had, been, had long been desolate. They were brought out of the nations, and now all of them, Israel, dwell safely. You will ascend like a coming storm, covering the land like a cloud. You, all your troops, and many peoples with you. All these kings, all these nations, coming together, swooping down on Israel after she's been gathered together in her land. Ezekiel, writing thousands of years ago, is talking prophetically about Israel that's over there right now. And here comes all these nations. Can I see the summary by Guzik at that point? Feinberg wrote a summary of Ezekiel 38 and 39. They tell, if interpreted literally, which I take it literally, 
of a coming northern confederacy of nations about the Black and Caspian Seas with Persia, that's Iran, and North Africa, who will invade the promised land after Israel's restoration of it. So what I know for sure, Israel's back in the land. What I know for sure, she's restored the land. What I know for sure, at some point in time, it ain't like Hamas, it's not like Hezbollah, it's not like even Iran. I mean, they're all coming, all of them. United. And you say, well, why would God do that for a really good reason? Do you want to know? Oh, let's read on. You say, when's this going to happen? Sometime. <laughs> Sometime. Could. Verse 10. Thus says the Lord, on that day it'll shall, it shall come to pass that thoughts will arise in your mind, God can make God, and you will make an evil plan. You will say, I will go up against a land of unwalled villages. I'll go to a peaceful people who dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates, to take plunder and to take booty, to stretch out your hand against the waste places that are again inhabited and against the people gathered from the nations who've acquired livestock and goods, who dwell in the midst of the land, Sheba and Dedan, the merchants of Tarshish, and all of their young lions will say to you, have you come to take plunder? Have you gathered your army to take booty and to carry away silver and gold, to take away livestock and goods, to, to take great plunder? Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say to Gog, thus says the Lord God, on that day, when my people Israel dwell safely, will you not know it? Then you will come from your place out of the far north, you and many peoples with you, and all of them riding on horses, a great company and a mighty army. You will come up against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land. It will be in the latter days that I will bring you against my land. God will bring Gog. God will bring Gog. God will bring you against my land, Israel's my land, so that the nations may know me when I am hollowed in you, O Gog, before their eyes. Thus says the Lord God, are you he of whom I have spoken in my former days by my servants, the prophets of Israel, who prophesied for years in those days that I would bring you against them? You say, what's God doing? He's using all these evil nations. He's manipulating them to come down against Israel, and then he's going to wipe them out. Yeah. Well, why is God going to do that? So the world might know that God is God. Yeah. And you say, well, that's new. Not to the Bible, it's not. You want to talk about Egypt? You want to talk about Assyria? You want to talk about Babylon? You want to talk about Rome? That's the way God does it. He takes them by a hook in their nose. And he drags them from the north. And then they get there and they think it's their idea. Let's just wipe them out. That's what you think. It's a setup by God. Don't you love the Bible? I mean, I love it. That's why I'm just being honest with you. This story is going to happen. Will it happen before the rapture? It might. Will it happen after the rapture? It might. Will it happen before the tribulation? It might. Could it happen right after it? It could, but it's going to happen. Well, what happens next? Well, God tells us, verse 18. And it shall come to pass at the same time when Gog comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord God, that my fury, my fury will show in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, so that the fish of the sea, the birds of the heaven, the beasts of the field, all creeping things that creep on the earth, and all men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. The mountains shall be thrown down, the steep places shall fall, every wall shall fall to the ground. I will call for a sword against Gog, 
throughout all my mountains, says the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother. They start killing each other. God's done that before. And I will bring him to judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. I will rain down on him and on his troops and on many peoples who are with him. Flooding rain, great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Somebody should make a movie about this. Like, way to go, God. It sounds like the book of Exodus. It sounds like the book of Joshua. It sounds like the book of Revelation. It's the book of Ezekiel. This thing could happen tomorrow. Could happen tomorrow. Verse 23, thus I will magnify myself, sanctify myself. I will be known in the eyes of many nations. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. It's like you said, well, Israel should get ready. Israel doesn't have to do anything. Not for this battle. God wipes them out with earthquakes and brimstone and fire and rain and the wrath of his fury. I mean, they're gone. And the world will know. God did it. Chapter 39, and you, son of man, prophesy, prophesy against Gog and say, thus says the Lord God, behold, I'm against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh and Meshach and Tubal. I will turn you around and lead you on, bringing you up from the far north and bring you against the mountains of Israel. Then I will knock the, I will knock the bow out of your left hand and cause the arrows to fall out of your right. You shall fall upon the mountains of Israel, you and all your troops and the peoples who are with you. I will give you to the birds of prey and every sword of the beast of the field to be devoured. You shall fall on the open field, for I have spoken, says the Lord God. I will send fire on Magog and those who live in security in the coast, and those who live in the security of coastlands. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. So I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them profane my holy name anymore. Then the nations, the nations shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Surely it is coming. It shall be done, says the Lord God. This is the day of which I have spoken. Can I hear an amen? amen. Woo! You say, well, explain that to us. Well, that would take weeks and weeks and weeks. But it's true. You got Blue Letter Bible. You got God questions. Look it up. It's right there in your Bible. You don't even have to look up too much. What it says is what it means. Amen. He's hauling them down. At some point in time, Israel's going like, oh no, we're going to be wiped out. God says, no, you want, this is Gog and Magog. <laughs> Did you know there's enough fuel left over from that battle, which is, you know, nations that come down, that Israel for seven years, seven years, all those needs taken. Did you know, just to bury the dead, it takes seven months. Did you know they have to go out and flag all the bones? They have to flag the bones. They have to cleanse the land. There are so many things. And there's a lot of things that well, conjure up other stuff in your head, but I'm just saying, okay, I'm looking at what happens next for Israel. Birth pains, absolutely. Damascus, uh, maybe. Gog and Magog, it's not maybe, it's just when. It's when. Guzik would summarize what I just read to you this way. A leader from the north, Gog, who was not an ancient enemy of Israel, will lead a confederation of nations against Israel. He will be motivated by his own evil plans and pulled by God. It will happen in the latter days. The allied nations will come from every point on the compass, including modern Iran, that would be Persia, peoples from the lands of modern Turkey, Libya, Ethiopia, Ethiopia, perhaps Armenia, and, uh, and maybe even Germany. Gog and his allies will come as a massive, swift, well-equipped army. Gog will come against Israel when they are gathered back in their land. Gog will come against Israel when they enjoy considerable safety. Gog will come against Israel when they are prosperous. Other, nature, other nations will watch and wonder how they might benefit themselves from Gog's conquest of Israel. Yahweh will defend Israel and defeat Gog. 
and thereby, thereby glorify himself amongst the nations. Pastor Bill, what's next? Birth pains, for sure. Damascus, maybe. Gog and Magog, You got Russia, you got Iran, you got Turkey, you got Lebanon, you got Syria. Whatever you think, you know what's going on because you watch CNN or Fox News, you have no idea what they're talking about behind closed doors. And if they think they can pull it off, you know where they got that idea? From God. And then they conjure up all their evil things and then God pulls them. It's all a setup by God. Why? Not only to save Israel, but to let the world know their God is God. I mean, it's, it's the same Egypt, Exodus story that you have. I mean, that's a great story, right? Haven't you ever wondered, like, man, we missed the great story. You haven't missed nothing. Whether we're here or we're there. I mean, the really big stories are still coming. Okay, I got to move on. What's next? Birth pains for sure. Damascus, maybe. Okay, Gog and Magog, for sure, but I don't know when. Tomorrow? Or a hundred years from I don't I don't know when, but that one will happen. Opportunity for the Antichrist. Opportunity for the Antichrist happens at some point in time. Israel gets back into a corner to where she can't come up with the answers. Now this is different than Gog and Magog. But she gets back into a corner. She can't find the answer. There's no way, there's no way to win. There's, there's no way out. Somehow America or the United States, and we, we can't figure it out. And that's why a guy from Europe, I believe he comes out of Europe, is going to come down and rescue her with a false treaty. They're going to think he's their Messiah, but he's anti-Messiah. He comes riding on a white horse, like in Revelation. To, he represents, like, I'm, I'm here to save the day, but it's a false Christ. But they actually sign a seven-year treaty. You say, how do you know that? Well, Daniel chapter 9, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're, I want you to go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We were there last week, but we're going back there. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And uh, verse 3, that's on page 1451. What happens next? Birth pains. Maybe Damascus. Gog and Magog, somewhere for sure. Opportunity for the Antichrist. That will happen. writing to the church, they thought they'd missed the rapture. <laughs> they actually thought they were actually in the tribulation. So Paul writes them a letter. Aren't you glad that God reassures us? You'll know when you're in the tribulation. You'll know it. It means you don't know Jesus and you did miss the rapture. I mean, you'll know it. I don't have to look for the Antichrist. Hear me. I don't have to look for the Antichrist. I'm looking for Christ. But like I told you last week, but when I see the stage getting set for tribulation, like if the stage is being set for Christmas, I know Thanksgiving's gonna come here first. Right. So when I see the stage being set for Antichrist, the stage being set for peace treaties, the stage being set, somebody's gotta do something. Hmm. Verse three, chapter two, Second Thessalonians. Let no one deceive you, Grace Church, by any means, for that day, the great day of the Lord, the tribulation, the seven years. That day will not come unless the falling away, that can be falling away, can also be taken away. 
I actually think that's part of the rapture. Unless the rapture, the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed. The son of perdition. Who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God. Or that is worshipped. So that he, the Antichrist, the son of perdition, he actually sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Well, now, wait a minute, wait a minute, Paul. You're writing this book to the church of Thessalonica. Well, you can't, you can't have... You can't have an Antichrist sitting in the temple of God if you don't have an Israel. For 2,000 years, you didn't have an Israel. You can't have that if you don't have a Jerusalem. We have a Jerusalem today. And you can't, ha you can't have that happen if you don't have a, a temple, if you don't have a ta at least a tabernacle on the holy mount. You've got to have a holy place. You've got to have God's place on the holy mount in Jerusalem. So everything's ready. Everything's ready. You need to know all that part is already ready. Uh, they, they actually have a museum in Israel where you can actually go in. They've got all the garments. They've got all the utensils. They've got all the bowls. They've got everything ready, ready to go with sacrifice. They're even looking for the ashes of a red heifer. They're looking for a perfect red heifer so we can come up with the ashes. I'm not making this up. Right. But what they don't have, they don't have the temple mount. They're going to get the Temple Mount. Well, how will they get the Temple Mount? Well, somehow there's going to be a peace treaty. Somehow it's going to be so bad, and I don't know if that's a bargaining chip that the Antichrist might play, or somehow they figure out how to do both up there on, you know, on the Holy Mount. I, I, don't, I don't know, but I know they're going to have a temple. And then I know there comes a day when that Antichrist, the guy that signed the peace treaty, he walks in, he says, fooey with you, I'm God. I'm God. He actually believes he's God. Anti-Christ. Now, when we start going down that road, I'm telling you, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff. Ain't no normal guy. He'll be able to do stuff nobody's been able to do before. They'll think he's Christ. Who are you looking for? Jesus. It's interesting to watch you just watch it. It's interesting to watch European common market. Interesting. It's interesting to watch the EU and commerce and one world monetary system and government and army. Who's in charge of what? Just watching. Do I have to worry? Don't have to worry about nothing. Let not your heart be troubled. All birth pains. Different guys rising up at different times. You know, some of you are so old like Scott Davey, you know, I'm sorry, Scott, but you know, they would actually be saying like Mussolini and, you know, you got to have a false prophet too and Hitler and all that kind of stuff. And obviously none of that was true, but that back then they thought, and that's even before you had Israel, we got Israel. You watch all this stuff. There's this one guy I've been kind of watching. Now, when you say, what do you mean by kind of watching? I've maybe spent all of maybe total time, 40 minutes. I don't want to do a deep dive on this guy. I don't. I do a deep dive on Jesus. I spend at least 40 minutes with Jesus every day. In one sense, I don't care who the Antichrist is. But when one guy keeps popping up, and he popped up since I was here last week with you guys. It's like, what is it? What is it with this guy? He's young. He's handsome. He's powerful. Has a whole family background like he's unbelievable. And he's just making his way around. He somehow thinks he, somehow thinks he can bring a peace treaty with Israel. Well, who are you to think that you can do that? Well, his name's Emmanuel. 
His name is Emmanuel, God with us. Macron, Mark, duh. And then just last week, can I see the picture? He's, he's down in Israel working out a peace treaty with Netanyahu. Now I just got goosebumps. Like, not because of him, but because you know what? That's crazy. That's crazy. So what are you saying? I'm not going to be troubled by it. God's in charge. Did I just tell you he's the Antichrist? I did not tell you that. Did I tell you there's a guy out of Europe with the name God with us down there shaking the hand? And, hey, I can offer you peace. And so, see, what I don't know, how far back in the corner is Israel going to get? How much can you back up that you're Emmanuel? I don't know. I don't know. I just know there's going to be somebody. Are we cool? So what did you tell us? Well, I told you, well, you know, I, I know for sure there's birth pains. That I know for sure. I, not sure, but Damascus, hum, something happens in Damascus where it's completely wiped out. That might be right before the millennial kingdom, but that's going to happen. Gog and Magog could happen tomorrow. It could happen tomorrow. I don't know. If, if you see everybody come down, get your Bible out and start reading Ezekiel 38 and 39. Close. Antichrist, there will be an Antichrist. But our Christ will come first. You can't make this stuff up. You just can't. I think, okay, I've covered all the bases, right? No, I didn't tell you the last part. There's one more option. And I'm just being straight up with you. No, nobody, I don't hear anybody talking about the last option, in my opinion. Nobody else thinks about it. Nobody else. Nobody else. Because everybody wants to go, doom and gloom, doom and gloom. <laughs> Be scared. <laughs> You know, buy our book that explains everything that's going to happen. Okay. You know, you can sell a lot of books, get a lot of guys on YouTube if you just really pump this stuff. That's, that's why, have you noticed, have you noticed, I waited till now not to get you guys all whacked out on, and when I say whacked out, you, you need to take it in priority. Birth pains is all we're sure about. And Jesus said, don't be troubled by it. That's what Jesus said. The baby's coming. And so you want to pay attention. But you don't make it like, okay, this is my whole life. I'm just going to study prophecy. Well, you'll get really frustrated. Every chart, everything I've ever seen. You know, I, I got the basics down. Then you got this. I, I don't know. I don't know. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. Be ready. But nobody says this. Nobody. What could happen next is that Israel is blessed and strengthened and increases. How did I say it? Continued growth, security, and blessing for current Israel. How did I do the subtitle on that? I forget. It just might get better. Uh -huh. Well, it's not going to get better. <laughs> what, are you God? How do you know? How do you know? Well, because all this stuff's going to get really bad. It will, but what if it gets better? Uh, what if it gets better? You have to leave that as part of what God wants to do. Don't we always think that? My life's just going to get worse and going to get worse and worse and worse. This church is going to fall apart and get worse and worse. And my world's going to get worse and worse. It might get better. Come on. <laughs> Best service we've ever had in this building was yesterday. It got better. Really better. Well, what do you mean by that? First time I go to Israel was like 30 years ago. Uh, 28 years ago. I was in Israel. And I went around, I was enamored by all the stuff and the things. And I remember when, when I put my hand on the wailing wall, I started crying, I started crying. And you said, well, why, you, why were you crying? Because I, I, I know, I know, it's all going to come down. It's all going to come down. It's going to get wiped out. Run for the hills. Pray it's not in winter. Don't be pregnant. I mean, gee, it's all going to come down again. I know that. But I fell in love with Israel. And then I, I realized it's all going to come down. 
Well, three, four years later, I went back. They didn't come down. Matter of fact, they were building skyscrapers and they had big old cranes out there and doing all this stuff. And I thought, well, it didn't come down. It got better. Then about four or five years after that, I went back again. Then it got a whole lot better. They put up this train system and things and all this stuff. You go around and everything's new and fancy. I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. And then I went back again and they keep building and building. They got all this stuff going on, but it keeps getting better. And I thought, well, that's interesting. I remember one time I was actually at the museum of the temple and I counted so many cranes around me. I took pictures of them. I think I counted 17 cranes building buildings. And I thought, it's, it's getting better. I, I thought it was all going to all fall apart and, you know, Y2K. No, <laughs> didn't happen. You know, the alignment of the moon and all the stuff, you know, way back in the day, they didn't happen. Well, yeah, but when the blood moons happened, nothing happened. It actually got better. Now, we know it's going to get worse, but we don't, we don't ever leave room for God who says, I might just bless them. That deal with Saudi Arabia, that's not pie in the sky. That, that could be a huge blessing. She might even expand her borders. She might even become more popular. Now, I don't know, but there is that chance she could get better. Can I hear an amen? Because we are always gloom and doom like it's over. Well, don't be troubled about it. Amen. It might get better. Amen. It did today. It did today. I was blown away today. Well, what happened? I didn't expect it. I couldn't envision it. I went home to have a sandwich at lunchtime with my wife. And it, if you're like me, I'm checking Israel every chance I get. I pull it up and I want to see what's going on. What's going on? And it wasn't Israel. It was the house and the new speaker. Well, I've been kind of watching that for the last month. And they landed on a guy. Never heard of him before. Well, who is that? Oh, Mike Johnson. I don't know who that is. And he's up there and he won, he won the house. Okay. I don't, I don't, I'd never seen him before. Who is that guy? And then I noticed he's got his Bible up there. Well, who are you? That's your Bible, isn't it? What are you going to say? I could not believe what I heard that man say as the house speaker. I command you, look it up on YouTube when you get home. I greatly suggest. I couldn't believe. Sydney and I were sitting there going, I kept looking at her like, what just happened? What happened? The guy's preaching a sermon out of the Bible in front of Nancy Pelosi. What just happened? What happened? What happened? What happened? And I kept looking. He already won the speakership. But he's letting everybody know. And then he started reading, you know. And I'm thinking like, it just got better. Now, I don't know how long it'll last. He ticked off a whole lot of people. But some, somehow, we have a brother. We have a brother. Because I looked him up. I looked him up. I, I got to know. I got to know. I told Cindy, if he's a Mormon, I'm in trouble. <laughs> but he ain't a Mormon. He's a Baptist. <laughs> With a Bible. You know the first thing he did? You know the first thing he did after they did all the vote and all the stuff? The first thing he did, he prayed. He prayed with everybody. God, would you lead us? Yeah. Would you lead us? Can I see the quote? This is what, he, I looked this up. Washington House Speaker Mike Johnson confirmed Wednesday after three failed previous Republican choices and weeks after inter-party turmoil is an evangelical Christian whose connections to Israel reflect the movement's deep ties to the Israel right, which has become increasingly mainstream over the years. I thought, it just got better. I go, well, it just got better. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. My hope is not in politics. But when I see a brother that takes his Bible and prays, oh, who's in charge? God. And I, I already know everybody's going to come against him. I know, but you know what? That's God will be God. 
and we know him. And the only thing you have to worry about is keep watching for Jesus. Keep looking for Jesus because the birth pains continue. Amen. Amen. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that you are sovereign, that you've written all these things down for us. We don't have to jump to conclusions. We can rejoice in the truth of Jesus. We can pray. We can pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We can pray, Lord, that all these other countries and all the turmoil, that somehow in your grace and your mercy, the gospel of the Lord Jesus would win. And I would praise you for a new Mike Johnson. Would you help our country, Lord? Would you bless the United States of America and the nation of Israel, Amarillo, Texas, Western and Plains? Would you bless us that we might hunger for your word and to represent you well? And how soon, how very soon, Jesus is going to come for his bride. May you find us ready, our lamps full of oil. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. It's in your name.